Hi, this is Tim Power, host of the Time to Talk Australia podcast. Now, as many of you know, this show is usually very light. It's all about entertainment. It's the world of pop culture. That's films and videos and music and everything to do with entertainment. We generally talk about celebrities here, and it's a little bit of an escape from our everyday lives, right? Well, this podcast is a little bit different. And I just wanted to give you a heads up. I'd love for you to listen to Will's story. But I will tell you, it's actually very upsetting. It's quite confronting. And it really will make you think. It's a real-time story as told by somebody who is facing what I describe as modern homelessness. Now, even though it is so important for Will to have the opportunity to tell his story, I will say this, after listening back to it myself, if you're not in the best place, I cannot strongly advise enough that you turn this off now and maybe wait until you're in a better place or until you've got somebody that cares about you with you as you listen to this, because it is quite upsetting. Now, for those of you in Australia, if you do listen to this and it brings up issues maybe triggers something in yourself don't forget about lifeline australia most of us know about it it's a fantastic phone service free of charge and they can be reached on 13 11 14 for the rest of the world please make yourself aware of what phone services you have available to you before you listen to this because it might bring something up for you now with will's full permission he has said that I can share his Instagram so that people who listen to this and want to talk to him and reach out can. And you may want to do that. He can be found at The Little Woo. Okay, so just bear with me on that. It's the words the, T-H-E, underscore, lil, L-I-L, which I assume stands for little, and underscore woo, W-O-O, the underscore lil underscore woo will i know you'll be listening to this and my heart is with you and i will be in touch thank you so much for sharing your story do you know what though mate i wish we were meeting under better circumstances yeah me too to be honest with you but it is what it is you make the best of what you get well they're lovely words but i think you're going to (laughs) You're going to give us a flavour, right, about what you've been going through because I've been watching your Facebook streams, a a few of them over the past few days, and essentially you're telling this, dare I say it, modern-day story of homelessness because Mm -hmm. we think of homelessness, we think of the, the, the person who's there, you know, with cardboard boxes over the top of them, but in fact, in cross Western nations there's a scourge of homelessness that is invisible to the eye and i feel like that's what maybe you're going through i hope i'm not making an assumption there no i you know what i never thought at this point in my life being 36 and homeless that this would be my life and what's really upsetting is there is a housing crisis and everyone knows it but there's no support for that i mean i I mean, we'll go into it in depth a bit later, I suppose, about what the actual process is that I'm going through. But to be in this part of my life, I guess, feeling so helpless and come Wednesday, I am going to be in a cardboard box in the street because that's when my official help runs out. We need to make it really clear you're working through um, services and systems in Australia, which aren't dissimilar to, to those overseas, though. And what's really struck me about your uh, videos that you're sharing is the the administration i think that's the only word i can Mm. think about it like all right let me put it this way i get out of bed every morning and i work my ass off like really Mm -hmm. really hard in many different ways and when i go to sleep i've done a hard day's work when i watch your streams even though you aren't employed currently and you don't have housing currently you've worked just as damn hard as me working and travailing your way through these systems which seem absolutely devoid of dignity um 
that is probably the the nicest way of putting it. One, there is no dignity. It's completely dehumanizing. And every time you go into these offices, they make a point of telling you how many days you've been in there and how many days you've required their support. And that's inverted commas support. And that doesn't take into account of uh, circumstances that involve trauma. So I'll give you a run through of what happened to me very quickly. Um, I became homeless. Um, I, so I, I exited a hospital uh, after an eight-day stay from a heart infection. And then my friend said, why don't you come and stay with me for a bit till I got on my feet. While staying with him, unfortunately, he sexually assaulted me and I felt it no longer safe to stay there. So I left. I was then put into um, temporary accommodation and in the, in the central um, CBD hotel that the government allocated me in. Um, then I witnessed a guy jump from the top floor and land right in front of me. Um, and that is traumatic in and of itself. Mm. So then after being on hold to link to home for two hours, um, they moved me to Summer Hill, the only room left in the state. Um, and I asked for support, someone to talk to after what I just witnessed. Um, and there was no one available because it was a Sunday afternoon. So then um, I asked, can I have a friend come and visit me? I just didn't want to be alone. And their rules are that there is no one to visit you when you are in temporary accommodation. So I had to sit in a room by myself and just deal with the fact that I had witnessed someone jump off a building and land in front of me after being sexually assaulted not long before that. And even still, I went into the office on the Monday and said, look, I know I have until tomorrow to get my ducks in a row, but I need more time. This is what I've witnessed. This is the report I've dropped in. And the woman said plainly, I don't know why you're so upset. It's not like you died. How am I supposed to look, look for a place to live when I don't even get a full night's sleep because I hear someone's body hit the ground every time I go to sleep? Or, you know, how do I feel that I, why I can't go into a shared bathroom because I'm scared that I'm going to get attacked again? And, again, none of that is taken into account when you're in services like this. And the fact is I've applied for three jobs as well while being like unhoused and unemployed. And that still doesn't work in your favour because they think that finding accommodation is um, the first thing you have to do. But then you've also got other departments saying, no, you need a job. And so there's not enough hours in the day. And that's if you have the full mental capacity to, to, to do this. And I'm running on half empty because I'm still traumatised about all the stuff I've seen. But as I understand it, they don't even put you up. Yep. In a place where you stay no. for a longer period of time, they're very short term and you've got to be up and at and out there looking for somewhere different the very next morning. So this is a day in, day out cycle. Is that correct? Um, well, sometimes it's three days in, three days out. Um, and it's, you know, the, the rule is they don't want you getting comfortable. And, and I can understand that because if people get comfortable, then they don't try. And I can understand that. However... It's not taken on a case-by-case -case basis. It is across the board, everyone's treated the same. And I don't understand how that can be when I've just endured so much trauma or, you know, how I'm on the same wavelength as a man who's just been released from custody or from someone who has just escaped a DV or domestic violence situation. Like, I, we're not all on the same playing field, yet we're all tired with the same brush, and that's really frustrating. You talked about going into hospital for a heart infection, but yes, were you? Can you take us even earlier than that? How did when you look back? How did it get here? Yeah, like without putting too fine yeah. a point on it. Like you, you've said it yourself. You're you're 36, and you never thought you'd find yourself here. Have you had time to think about how that happened? I mean, I'm still thinking about that every day. Uh, so my old flatmate and I, we lived in the CBD of Sydney. We had a great apartment, a little small and a bit expensive, but it was great and it was ours. Uh, I however, of Sydney, was it? Yeah, yeah. And we actually got that place during the second lockdown of the pandemic. So, of course, I thought, well, I'll be fine. I can get us a new place um, after this at least expires. I mean, 
I've got this place, so yeah, I'll be fine. Can I just ask though, during COVID, Ooh. just in case international listeners don't understand, and I'm sure yeah. this happened across the world, rents were just they went nuts in the upwards direction. Do you mind me asking yeah. like where it started and was did the rent go up and was that a factor? That was the main factor. So we were paying seven sixty a fortnight and then that went to a thousand a week. Oh my god. And so we couldn't afford that. So we had to move. Um, and again, thought, you know what, I'm, I got this place during the lockdown, so I can get this, I can get us a new place. Um, and no, um, you know, there is 40, 50 people at the inspections you go to. And of that 40 or 50 people, 20 of them have kids. Yeah. And as a single gay man, I got no hope competing against someone with kids. Kids should always come first. And I I agree with that. Kids need a home. But I also need a home. And there is there is so much demand and not enough supply. And the people who get punished for that are people who are actively looking. My day starts with me getting out of well, trying to get out of bed. Right now I'm battling depression because of having all this going on and trying to deal with that, put on a happy face, make myself presentable, go out um, and then go to inspections where I am one of 30, 40 people and then know it's not going to happen and still be forced to apply for it as I get my support revoked. And then oh, having see, cases- there's an obligation is there for you to apply for a certain yeah. amount of housing. And can Houses, I just say yeah. that putting in an accommodation application in Australia, that paperwork is horrendous. You need copies of this and that, and they insist yeah. that you're employed, right? So it must yeah, be. Yeah, most of them insist you're employed and um, they want, and sometimes they have, they ask for things they have no business in asking for. Like they want your last 10 years of work. Now, that's none of their damn business. They ask for your statements for the past five years, none of your damn business. Like, all they need to know is that I can pay the rent and that's all, you know, and I have my Centrelink. And from time to time, if I do, like, cash and hand work or if I do sex work, I, you know, have a bit more money to eat with. But other than that, that it's very intrusive. And just today, funnily enough, I got up to go and inspect a property and I arrived and they said, oh, no, no, we're not letting you see the property. And I said, why is, why is that? And they said, well, on the phone, we thought you were a lady. This is for a female only, despite the fact that their ad did not say female only. And so not only was I deeply <laughs> um, humiliated, but had my time wasted. And that counts as not looking for a place according to the accommodation uh, obligation I have to meet. The situation on the ground is the most serious that I have seen. The level of financial deprivation, the acute and chronic mental anguish um, and distress because people simply cannot now make ends meet. I'm here in Brisbane where mini tent cities like this one keep popping up. It's kind of a snapshot of what we're seeing right around the country. Now, advocates say it's really hard to get an accurate picture of the numbers because the situation is so fluid. But the last census did find that one in 200 people were of no fixed address on that night in 2021. But of course, that was well before the cost of living crisis started to bite. The government's housing accord is promising 30,000 social and affordable homes over the next five years. Advocates say we need 10 times that and we need them now. Um, so in my, in my specific bracket of 290, there is eight properties I can view. I have viewed all eight properties. I have applied for all eight properties and that's all I can afford. That's all I can do. And it's not enough. And do you mind me asking, to, on top of every complicating factor you've just mentioned there, 290 a week yeah. in Sydney wouldn't get you very much, would it? A room maybe? It gets you a room with a shared bathroom. And, again, fuck my trauma with a shared bathroom. Like, they, no one gives a shit about that, despite the fact that I could have a severe mental breakdown about it. No one cares. Um, mm. And, so it, again, it's just it's dehumanising and the real kicker about all of it is that there's 
vast, extensive case notes on my on my file about me and what's going on, and they look at them and they tell me again it's not enough. And you go into these offices with these bureaucratic people across the table who are so impartial because they have to be and are so not empathetic because that's how they survive because it's a horrible job and you beg them for mercy you beg them to look at you you beg them you beg them to look at you in the eye when they speak to you you beg them to please give you a hand because you can't cope anymore do you know i i have had suicidal tendencies in my life in the past six months, they've gone to attempts now. I've walked into traffic. I've tried to go over my balcony. I've tried to go in front of a train, which is how my brother died. I, you know, it's getting to the point now where if I don't find a place by this Wednesday, I don't think I'll be here for Christmas. And that's really scary. Yeah. Will, how long have you been homeless now for? Since May. and. You know, I still work in the harm reduction space. I still sit on four committees and two panels for drug health and drug safety in Australia um, in New South Wales. I still, I, I carry naloxone in case I see someone having an opioid overdose. And um, I have actually reversed four of them in the public, like at train stations and stuff, people who have overdosed on heroin or whatever. I've saved their lives in train stations just to bring them back to life. Um, So I still do bits for the community and I still care about people. And it's just really disheartening that no one sees it because I want someone to take some mercy on me. And, and, and they don't. And I guess, and oh, I forgot to mention this thing, Um, gay flatmate finder or gay share or whatever that stuff. I've gone on about 40 um, viewings from those. And they don't count as viewings because that is seen as a sublease. So if I go and just say you have a spare room and you put it on Gay Flatmate Finder and I come and view it, that doesn't mean anything because I wouldn't be going on the lease. Doesn't count towards your obligation. Got it. No. Well, a lot of people listening would be curious about your network of support. Who have you got yeah. around you? Do, do you have family you can lean into? No. Um, so my family and I are estranged and, I mean, that's that's fine. I mean, it hurts. Um, and, but it, it's, it's fine. Um, I don't have a partner and um, I don't have many friends. I kind of am just doing it all alone, really. Um, the support I have, I have... From working in in alcohol and drug space, like I've made networks with you know mental health and things like that, but it's hard for me to go to those places. For example, if I feel suicidal, it's hard for me to go to an emergency department because some of the clients that I've worked with in the past are in those wards and will want to ask me about things, and I I don't have the mental strength to to just go in there and defend myself or say anything. So so I don't. I stay at home or wherever I'm staying and I get scared to go outside. So I don't. And it's I only go to the Department of Housing when I have to, which is every three days, and then you sit there for five hours waiting for your number to be called, uh, which could have been, you know, spent me looking at houses. And I've also seen in your videos how you literally live stream yourself walking. I, I, I noticed last night, yeah. I saw you getting in trouble, in inverted commas, <laughs> by a staff member for having your live stream on in one of these centres. Oh, that but- was that, – okay, that day, Han, let me let me go back for that day. That day was one of the worst of my lives where I nearly walked in front of a train that day, and this is what happened. So that time I was live streaming – was just after the guy had jumped from the building and I went into the Ashfield office as opposed to the Strawberry Hills office where I normally go because I was told by Link to Home I could go to the Ashfield office. So I had my little pack of stuff there and I went into Ashfield office. I waited in there for two hours and spoke to this girl behind the counter, behind the glass, 
who said, oh, I can't help you, but you can call them on that phone over there and pointed to the phone on the wall. So then I went to that phone on the wall, which was an automatic dialing phone, connects you straight to Link to Home. I then spoke to the guy to Link to Home for, again, 45 minutes on and off hold. And he then tells me to literally wave my hand in the air because a staff member is trying to find me. To which I thought, well, you're kidding me. This is, no, this is not dignified. But I did it. I waved my hand and said, yeah, I got my hand in the air. And eventually a staff member comes over. At that point, there was also a woman there with two children who were really screaming and unruly in the background, making my head boil. And so I just want everyone to picture this. I have a guy on the phone talking at me, a staff member talking at me, and two kids screaming their head off in the background. I hit my limit and just went, oh, for God's sake, because I was told that no one could help me in this office. I was then told that, well, if I'm going to be rude and disruptive, I can leave and that I can call, I, you know, I don't need to cause trouble. To which I thanked the guy on Link to Home, hung up the phone, called the guy an asshole because he had seen me the entire time and just did nothing to help me. And then he walks away and comes back and says, you can't live stream here. To which I reply, yes, I can. There's no signage to say that I can't. He goes, there's children here. I said, well, that's their problem, not mine. There's no signage. And then as I'm leaving, the security guard says to me, you can't post that on social media. I said, I already have. You don't have any signage that says I can't. Now, I then call uh, DCJ at the Strawberry Hills and tell them, you know, I'm, I'm at my wit's end. I've wasted my morning and my dignity in this office asking for people to help me and only to be told that I'm a troublemaker and that I'm rude and that I'm, you know, not worth helping as sensibly. What is someone like that meant to do? The system that is meant to help us, it's not helpful. You're, it's like, even just going over it now, like I'm, you can't see it, but I've actually got tears rolling down my eyes just reliving this day. And I somehow got to Central Station and was sort of dragging my feet up to up to where I had to go to Strawberry Hills and I started to walk towards the cars in the middle of the road and this road worker saw me and he sort of grabbed me and, and pulled me onto the sidewalk and he goes mate what are you doing and I just bawled my eyes out in front of him just like just bawled my eyes out and said to him I I don't want to be here anymore I can't I can't do this anymore i can't wake up every day feeling like a failure because it's killing me i'm capable and i'm competent and yet nothing i'm doing works and it's not doesn't matter what i do and i feel like a failure every day and he gave me a hug and he said i'll walk you to where you need to go and so he walked me to the department of housing and he gave me 50 dollars and he goes, I want you to get help, man. Um, and then he waited 15 minutes for me to go inside. And then he waited around out the front and then he left because he wanted me to get some help. And it was one of the nicest things anybody has ever done for me. But it just goes to show that the system is broken and it doesn't. it's not set up for people who are vulnerable like me. And I might be competent and I might be capable of doing things. But right now I need help and there's just no help available. And I'm sorry for crying. And I'm sorry for losing it. I'm so sorry you're in this situation. It's, <clears throat> it's um, I can't imagine being in your shoes. I am imagining that you chose to live stream some of these moments in your life over the past six months because... It's almost as if people won't if believe I it. Yeah. yeah. Like even that concept of something as basic as you've got up, you don't know where you're going to be sleeping that night, and you're in an office and you're waiting literally hours to be called. And you, having done this for so long, probably know that the person that you're going to speak to won't be able to actually give you the help that you need after all of yeah. that wait time anyway. Yeah. Yep. And it's also a Russian roulette kind of thing of you roll the dice of if that person is nice to you or not. 
like ladies who I speak to have been a lot more helpful than the gentlemen. The gentlemen I spoke to have shamed me, have uh, implied that I don't do enough, implied that I'm lying. Um, you know, the women, the women I spoke, to, I've spoken to understand um, maybe sexual assault, understand what it's like to be leered at when you don't want to be. You know, there's a lot more caring from the ladies than the men. That's for sure. <laughs> We are here today in 2023 with this situation because of bad policy decisions and failures um, over the last 30 years. After four months on those Sydney streets, Lee finally has somewhere safe to live. Ah, it's my lucky day. <laughs> He's been handed the keys to a one bedroom public flat starting to mentally identify that, hey, this is my little place now. I've actually got a place for myself now. <laughs> wow, it, to me, it's literally like winning a lottery. Big change. So wonderful to happen. I wish it would happen for everyone is, is the challenge. All the homeless people need, need such a change. Will, what's the advice that they're giving you? Is it as simple as, hey, mate, you need to go and get housing and yep. here's, uh, uh, like, make your applications? Or are they giving you... Any bigger advice that maybe you can't follow or don't want to follow? Like, what, what advice are you getting from these specialists, these social workers? Um, I get given a like a booklet of housing inspections that are available for the week, which is great. Um, so then they said, you know, you got to apply for these houses, and out of these ten that are in this book, three of them are in my price range. Two of them I've already viewed, and two of them I've already applied for. Um, and that's it. You apply for them or not. And if you go to the inspections, you have to show evidence. Now, this is the tricky part as well. So evidence includes, so every email that I do, every application, I take a screenshot and then I email it to them at their email saying, upload it to my file and give them my Centrelink number. So I have, hang on, I'm just opening up my Outlook now and I can tell you exactly how many things I've sent 107 emails and and it's still not enough evidence i don't have enough evidentiary support to warrant any more helping so my last visit to dcj or department of housing um they said to me well you've had and this is the kicker they let you know that you know you've had 47 days with our with our assistance 47 days um, yes I, i'm well aware of that there's no it's almost like there's a housing crisis um, and they said, well, you know, you need to find somewhere. Yes, I know I do, but there's nowhere to find. I've applied for everywhere. I've, you know, there's nothing more I can do. So what else is there to do? And so then they say, well, we're taking all your evidence and we're taking it up to the top, top manager, which is, you know, whoever that is. And then, and then they argue on my behalf for me to get extended support. So then I was told to go away for lunch and then come back in half an hour. I came back half an hour later and then I sat for another 45 hour max. And then they said, we've given you seven more days support, which takes me to this Wednesday. And as of this Wednesday, that's all the support I get. If I don't have a home, then I don't have anything. And, then, and I don't see me surviving much longer. When you open up a, you know, um, Gumtree or Craigslist, there are people, you talked about subleasing before, so people who have rooms available, and I know they don't count towards your obligation, but yep. is, is that an option for you? Do you actually approach people who have, you know, the metaphorical <laughs> letter on the wall saying, hey, room available? Yeah, I, I have, even though it doesn't count towards my obligation. Yeah, of course I have, because I'm, I'm desperate. But mm -hmm. a lot of them say, you know, are you working? Uh, no. Um, can you afford the bond? No, but I can pay in instalments. Um, mm. I don't have any money. And when it's so competitive, there's yeah. someone who can do those things, right? They can pay the bond and yep. all of that. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, you know, the other day when I was in the DCJ and 
I'd come back into the office. There was a bloke who asked me for a phone charger, and I was like, "Yeah, here you go, man. Keep it." Like you know, gave him my phone cable. Keep it. I, you know, whatever. I got heaps. And he said, "I thought you know you'd be lovely. You know, you got a really kind smile about you. So thank you." And I said to him, he asked me why I was why I was in there, and I told him what had just happened to me. And I said, "What about you?" And he looked at me and he had this very earnest smile about him. And he goes, oh, I had someone put a gun in my mouth last week. And I sort of said, pardon? And he goes, I had someone put a gun in my mouth last week, but, you know, it's all right. And he had this really sweet smile about him. I said, why is that all right? That's that's traumatic, man. And he goes, yeah, the, the Lord will take care of me. So I'm not worried. And there was a there was a bit of me that was very jealous of him for having that faith in something that everything would be okay because I didn't have that. But it was also he had this way of sort of just being okay with everything, whereas I'm totally panicking about everything now, and I'm jealous of that. And because I've always believed that if you do the right thing, the right things will happen for you. Which is why, you know, if someone's hungry, I'll give them food. If someone needs money, I'll give it to them if I can. If someone needs something that I have, I'll give it to them if, because, you know, it's what you do. If someone needs it, you give it. You need it, you take it. And right now, like, all my, my belief systems are obliterated. Mm. I feel like I feel like I'm disposable now and I feel like I'm nothing. And it feels so wretched to know that you are nothing to people and it's even worse to know that you're nothing to yourself anymore and that's hard to to deal with every day and yet I have to get up every day and go through the act of going to view houses I can't afford knowing that I won't get them and taking evidence of that and then going to them and begging for help and still being told that's not enough it's just so – I can't even describe how low that makes you feel. Mm-hmm. And how getting out of bed every day is just that little bit harder. And even today, doing the right thing, going and viewing the property and being humiliated how I was, and I'll have to explain that to them on Wednesday and be told that that's my fault. <laughs> I don't even have the money to move. I, I have a storage cage with all my belongings in it, which I'm two months behind in rent for, which, you know, all my stuff will be out on the street soon. I don't know what I'm going to do. It just sounds Good. like an incredible, vicious cycle. You, you're investing all your time in, in a process that is actually pointless by the sound of it because you know you're showing up for places that – you can't possibly get and you know that ahead of time then you've got to go back and prove that to the unsympathetic worker and they're probably a lovely person but they've probably got uh, oh yeah they've probably got that fatigue emotional fatigue from hearing these stories day in day out yeah um and if if you were to picture just the first step towards getting your life back on track will just the first step what would that be? Because I, I, I'm, as I'm listening to you and trying to put myself in your shoes, I couldn't even think about employment, reconciling with family, joining community groups, getting counselling for my trauma experiences without a freaking stable roof over my fa- head. I, I, I couldn't even think about those important things. What What's the important first step? What's the breakthrough moment for you? <laughs> um. Just hearing you say all of that, oh, my God, I don't know. I mean, a good night's sleep would be wonderful, a good night's sleep where I'm not scared or a good night's sleep where I don't hear that body hit the ground, like a good night's sleep where I don't have to go to bed scared and it's it's so hard. And, uh, I don't think anyone understands how hard this is and – when you don't have a job, it's even harder. And everyone just thinks that you're a blight on the system or that you're lazy or that you aren't motivated or whatever. 
And when there's so much more to that. For what it's worth, anyone listening to you would absolutely be unable to reach the conclusion that you're a blight. It, it, I think for me, maybe representing the people listening to you now, it's just such a fine line. This could be anyone. I mean, because you were a, a qualified, skilled, competent person and are. Yeah. And for just circumstances, you, you have ended up in this place. You will get through it, though, Will. You will get through it. It's about, at the moment, like you say, even a good night's sleep. Can you describe where are you as we speak right now? What, I'm where in a, are you? I mean, I came into this place. It's a, it's a wonderful charity called Jewish House. Um, they have two uh, places, one in Bondi and one in Ashfield, which is where I am. And Jewish House is a fantastic charity. Um, I recommend everyone giving to them because they give back a lot. Um, it's a mine's it's a halfway house. When I first came here, I had to have a shared bathroom. Um, my caseworker that works here was aware of my trauma and stuff, um, and he said, "Look, I just need you to hold out two days, and then we can move you into a room with an ensuite." So for two days, I I pissed in a bottle. And then I would I barely showered those two days because I was just too scared. Um, and then as soon as an ensuite became available, they moved me. Um, so like they're great that way. But it, you know, there is a lot of men in here that I don't know that are a lot bigger than me, a lot stronger than me, intimidate me. Um, they're not mean or anything, but you know, I'm I'm scared a lot of the time because they're they're big men, and mm. I'm not a big man. And how long can you stay in that accommodation? So every week I have to go to the Department of Housing uh, with a reference letter from my caseworker who advocates for me to stay. Um, for me to stay while they, you know, work around me getting into other housing, uh, like, options, like transitional housing or social housing. Now, there's a wait list on social housing, which is the council housing, and there is a wait list on transitional housing. So I have to call Mission Australia every day to see if I can get a room that day or not. And if I can't, if I can, then I move out of here. And if I can't, I have to stay here. So, um, but my my caseworker here at Jewish House will write a recommendation letter to which I have to take to DCJ or housing, and then housing say yes or no. We'll give you three days. We'll give you five days or seven days, and then that's it. And then you know, so. I can't stay here beyond those days. Yeah. Yeah. And that uncertainty is just yet another pressure in your life. And yeah. just to also give a sense to people too who aren't in Sydney, it's all very well. Like the, the process Will's in here of having to go and view places and prove that he's viewed them in a completely pointless exercise most of well, all of the time is – even that sounds terrible, but add on top of it, I'm imagining, Will, that to get to these places, there's public tra- – it's not as if, you know, you're walking 10 minutes and there you're there. Sydney's a big place. So I'm imagining yeah. there's a lot of getting to public transport and going for at least an hour in any direction. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm staying in Ashfield, but I had to view a place in Arncliff, which was me catching a train from Ashfield to Central, 45 minutes, and then getting a – train from central to rockdale another 45 minutes and then a train uh, so then a bus for 20 minutes to view this house and then you know still not get it and then come all the way back and you would so happily it, do it if there was if there was a, a vague slim piece of hope in going to see these places but from what you've described to me one thing i'm taking away very strongly is you know that when you put on that form that you don't have a job yeah, you can't afford the bond, and there's forty people viewing the house. Some have children. Yeah. Yeah. You you mustn't have any hope. It's just what you're doing to remain in the system, really. There is no hope, um, and I, I lost hope a long time ago. Um, I'm doing it purely mechanical to stay assisted, but I mean, my assistance runs out as of Wednesday. So as of Wednesday, doesn't matter what I've done, I'm going to be sleeping rough. Some people would be wondering if there's an option, and 
will you must know people fall into the solution focused talk which is sometimes very unhelpful but i'm going to ask what a few yeah. people Sydney would be thinking can you leave sydney where it is so intense and the com competition is so intense is there any point in leaving sydney and going somewhere <clears throat> a little bit remote and maybe there's more chance there or is that just not true going to a you know a rural area for example wh where my job you know where i've worked mainly in drug and alcohol and um, there is no way i could go to a more rural area and get more work there's no work there there's no houses there either like there's a housing crisis in all of australia where we've got all these people but nowhere to house them I have no money. My savings is all gone. All my tax, all my tax refunds that I got um, are all gone because you know I have to eat, and you know I had rent outstanding from my old place and all that sort of stuff. So you have so debt as well, yeah. I have debt, yeah. I have personal loans, which you know I have personal loan that I have to pay off, as well as my storage cage of my belongings. So I have all this. I can't just up and leave because I've got nowhere to go anyway. And, and from what I've been told, moving to somewhere like Melbourne or it's just like frying yeah. pan into the fire, right? Like It's, it's exactly it's, the same. Yeah. It's you'd exactly be, the same. You'd just um, be disconnected in a whole new place. Yep. And I did, I did, I did call my family actually. Sorry. I did call my family um, and – reconnect with my mum and dad and told them what was happening and they said well you can't come back here i said that's fine and not that i expected anything different i didn't but it was just a reinforcement of okay well that's them and that's me fair enough so even going home to queensland is not an option what has your life been like will has it always been tough like it is now uh, um, that misconception that people have that if you're in the situation you're describing to us right now, that this has always probably been an, a revolving door. But what's your life been like? My life has been had been great. I mean, I I lived in the UK for six months um, before the pandemic. Um, I was in a lovely relationship for six years. Um, before all of that, um, I had a, I, me and my partner, we had a place in Moorpark Gardens in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. We had, you know, I worked at the Opera House. He worked at uh, News Corp and Optus. Like, we had money. We were comfortable. We Then we lived in the UK. And then we came back here because of COVID and then our relationship dissolved and then I ended up, coming back to Sydney and living with a great flatmate who his name is Jared and Jared now lives back at home with his family because he couldn't afford rent either. Um, so it, it hasn't always been this tough. And, and I think if it had always been this tough, I would have been dead a long time ago. But because I keep thinking it's going to get better, if I just do the work, if I just keep trying, it'll get better. And now I'm feeling like more of an idiot because I've been trying and it's not getting better. Yeah, but please, for what it's worth, don't feel like an idiot. What you're describing to me is that sort of impossible map. If I was to draw it out, like you turn left, it's a stone wall. You turn right, it's a stone wall. This is not a will thing. This is uh, a system that isn't designed to give you an exit. What does get, need to change in the well, system? Well, I mean, like... It's very Sisyphusian, you know, or for those of you who aren't aware, Sisyphus was charged with r pushing a rock up to the top of the mountain and there was two rocks, sorry. He had to push one up to the top and when he would start pushing the other one up to the top, the other one would roll back down the other side. So it was an impossible situation. And that's where I feel like now is that once I get my rock up to the top and I go up to get the other one, the other one rolls back down. And it's just constantly trying to keep them both going and... Because you're fulfilling it's, your end of the bargain. You're being very compliant. Yeah. Like you, they're telling you you need to do X, Y, and Z, and you're going every day you're getting out of bed despite how difficult that must be. And you yep. are doing your end of the bargain. But it's not going to get anywhere. And I think that's – I don't know if it's a recent revelation to you, but it's certainly coming across to me that, yeah, you get that now and you can yeah. 
You don't yeah. accept it, but you get it. But what are you meant to do? Keep getting out of bed and keep doing this? Yes. Obviously, there needs to be a circuit breaker. What can the system do differently to break this circuit for you? Give me a home. Yeah. Give me a, a place where I can actually sleep. Um, is is that a- actually just to, just to, because that's such a simple point? But is that really being like in 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 um, New South Wales or Australia? If there was enough housing that could be not as short term, it needs to be short term, but not as short term as yours mm. is, which is not giving you any time to breathe, recover, and then apply for jobs, get yourself slowly back on your feet. Is that actually the like, answer that if we I need had enough more time social housing? In a week, if I had, if this was a dream scenario, somewhat like you know, quote unquote, it would be Monday, Tuesday would be my applying for jobs days, and then you know Wednesday, Thursday would be me inspecting and applying for houses. Friday is my therapy day, and then Saturday would be inspection days, and Sunday would be my rest day. Mm, yeah, mm. that would be. See, that sounds reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> does it sounds yeah. reasonable right yeah and that's um and that's because that's how it used to be if you were organizing a system like that from a you know a, a leadership level you'd have to yeah. stagger it so that everyone had different otherwise you'd have a run on the services on a particular day so you'd stagger yeah. it but i think it's really reasonable for you to say to the system i will live up to my end of the bargain but please allow me dedicated days to do all the things that i need to do as i said at the beginning of this you're doing a full-time job. You're working every bit as hard, if not harder, uh, than an employed person. And to sit in an office and wait for your number to be called, and that literally can take three to five hours, is the worst part because that's you know that that is time spent in that office that you could have been viewing or inspecting or applying or doing something else, but instead you have to sit there and you have to wait You've given us a really very powerful insight into what this is doing to you emotionally. What does it do yeah. to you physically? Because I'm picturing mainly probably from your live stream, you do a lot of walking with a backpack. Um, yeah. And as you've already said to us, uh, food is an issue. Like, What's the physical toll of all of this? Well, the physical toll is I walk everywhere. My shoes are running thin. I am overweight now because the food I am eating is cheap and not good for me. So a lot of it is frozen foods that I can chuck in the microwave. Mm. Um, so I've gained weight. Um, I get uh, the anxiety attacks that I have um, from everything else in my life is is crippling. Um, before I go out in public, I get the runs from nervousness so then i will spend about half an hour on the toilet before i go anywhere because i get so nervous um and just the sheer expectation of rejection my feet drag when i walk now because i'm just so i don't walk with my head up anymore and i just i used to be very confident and now i just now i just i'm honestly i'm just kind of waiting for death now and that's sad and that's and that's that's the truth. Like, my health is suffering, and my mental health is all but gone. You mentioned um, a day that you want to put aside for your therapy days. Are you attached to a really great counselor or therapist? I have. No, I used to think therapy was a joke. I used to think, you know, no. boys don't cry, and you know, you got a problem, you fix it, da da da, all that stupid stuff. And I am so grateful for my therapist at the Albion Center, Dr. Tracy. She is amazing in helping me realize the things that I brought up with and the neglect and the abandonment that I, that I had growing up was not my fault. And, you know, I understand now certain attachment styles and, and the things that I do wrong and and the things where I punish myself so much. It's trying to unlearn a lot of that behavior. But after I finish therapy, I come home, I like, to, like the accommodation where I'm at, and I just want to sleep because I'm so tired. Mm, mm. And so then I'll sleep the afternoon away because I just can't do anything else. I physically can't do anything else because yeah. I'm just emotionally shattered. And, you know, despite the fact that, you know, I mean, on the Friday that just went, we talked about the guy jumping from the building and 
that, that you know that's that spot of when you're about to go to sleep you're in bed and you're about to drift off and that's just you slowly fade out to sleep big time as you're about to drop off to that bit of sleep i hear the crash of the body on the ground every time yeah that's real and then that PTSI, wakes me up. isn't it it really is yeah and then so then i have to wake up and then it's trying to get to sleep after that and it's really difficult and so then after therapy, I talk about that, and then I come back, and I, then I want to sleep because I'm just so tired, and it's it's the only time I feel like I can sleep because I know there's no one around, and I feel safe enough to sleep, and then then I wake up feeling guilty because I slept, and what I don't do want mean? to feel guilty for sleeping, like because I should have Why been out looking look- for a place, I should have been out doing okay. something, not sleeping. I see. So it's day sleep. It's yeah. It's that yeah, exhaustion. It's afternoon sleep. sleep. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's. I, I should have been out looking for a home. I should have been out applying for a job. I should have been doing something more. But I physically can't do that anymore because I'm just so tired. And I feel so pathetic for crying about this because I thought I was stronger than this. I thought I was strong. I thought I was a lot stronger than this. And this feels like this is beating me and I don't want to be beaten by this but I feel like it's already won and I'm trying so hard and I didn't think I'd cry so much in this interview and I'm just like I can't hold it in anymore but I just feel like I'm gonna die soon because I can't keep going like this you are so resilient but I I can totally understand these circumstances that you've been dealt. I can understand why you feel like you're running out of resilience. But there'll be a moment, won't there? There'll be a moment, and you have to hold on to that where things will change. And it's going to be – I don't think there's – obviously, after listening to you, there's no magic wand moment, but it's little tiny baby win, baby win, baby win, and over time, right? I have would love to- one. I would love a baby win. I would love any kind of positive anything. Just a small win, right? Yeah. It it does sound like you, you, your caseworker, as you call them, yeah. is 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 one of those baby wins. They're advocating for you hard by the sound of it. Yeah, they are. But uh, according to the housing, they're not advocating enough. Right. It's, it's just, you know, the previous government did not give any housing. There's been no housing for, for decades. And now it's really bad. So if anyone's listening and you're in a rent a rent controlled apartment, stay there. Don't move unless you have to because it is so difficult. It is so hard. There was such a lack of planning around. I know it's a much bigger picture issue than the one you're facing, but they have yeah. not invested at all in social housing for decades. COVID was a catalyst. But yep. it exposed that there just isn't. They're doing it now, Will. Like there's big projects going up all over the place, but they're, cool. they're still from years away, right? Exactly. Yeah, it doesn't like, What it doesn't am I supposed to use now? Up. And then there are people like, and this is just as a generalisation, but there's a lot of Chinese investors who have bought a lot of our houses over here who don't live in them. Mm. And yet I've got nowhere to sleep tonight. And I just want a room. Just one room with a bed and an ensuite that I can have to ha- a base. I think that says it best. You need a base right now. This, as anyone listening knows, like you cannot sort your stuff out without a base. You just need somewhere where you can go. Right, I'm out the door. I've got to face this often cruel world, but I can come back here at the end of it and I can breathe and recover and then I'll do yep. it again. At the moment, you're spending I so much of your time, yeah, with the uncertainty <laughs> or going from place A to place B, which I imagine taking all your stuff from A to B, even though it's in a bag, I can't it's imagine. It's traumatic what, in and of itself. What do you want people to know, Will? I want people to know that homelessness exists Beyond the cardboard box guide out the front of the train station, um, homelessness exists um, for many different reasons. Not all homelessness, including myself, is for drugs. I'm not homeless because of drug use. I'm not homeless because of alcohol use. I am homeless because of a greedy landlord and a system that wasn't set up to help people in my situation. 
I'm homeless because there is not enough houses and I'm homeless and scared because I don't have time to worry about my safety and I'm homeless and I'm now really scared for my own mental health that I won't be alive for Christmas this year because it is so dire and and just to to have a bit more thought and a bit more care and if you know anyone who's struggling please just ask them how they are and listen to them because it's it would mean a lot to them just to be asked how they're feeling and how they're coping and if there's anything you can do because right now I don't even have that I'm by myself a lot and it would just make their lives a lot easier if people ask them how they're coping. Yeah. <sighs> Will, I am so sorry for what you're going through. I've listened in absolute amazement. You've taught me so much in all of this. There's so many aspects to it that people don't understand. And as you say, this myth that people create these situations – yeah. and should be accountable for them, well, it's such an unhelpful perception if it exists. And I like to think people who listen to this have a little bit more empathy than that. There is no equity by the looks of it. That It just sounds like it's a system with no equity in it, right? People yeah. like you and me, if I was to fall into that situation, our society should be proud to pick you up at those times and carry you until you're back on your feet. I'm well, so we judge, sorry. We judge societies on how they treat their most vulnerable. And if that's the case... We are awful people. It's un-Australian to not help out your mate, help out your neighbour, help out the person next to you because that's who we are and that's what we all portray us to other nations or what we're like. But right now I feel so alone. Well, all my thoughts and all my heart is with you. We'll stay in touch, okay? Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it.